5 tonight, 2 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse number 8, a very familiar verse to everybody here this evening, but 2 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8, the scripture says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the what? Devil, Devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Father, again tonight, we're thankful for an evening service. Thank you for all of these folks that have come out tonight. I pray that you would just be with us and help us to look at, I believe, this very, very important topic tonight that many times we do not take seriously. And I pray tonight if there be a lost person in our midst that you would save those individuals or individual. And tonight for Christians, Lord, that maybe are struggling tonight, that they would draw closer to you than they ever have before in their life. Now, bless tonight as only you can, and we're going to give you all the praise, honor, and glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, this morning we talked about the buck stops here, and we we're talking about the fact that the day is going to come when lost people will have no more time to make excuses and give reasons of why they never accepted the Lord Jesus. But we need to realize also in these days, somebody is at work. He's been at work all the way from the beginning of time, but I believe he's working overtime now in our world. And the reason is because he knows time is getting short and the Lord Jesus' return is drawing near. And I'm talking about the devil tonight. I don't think that a lot of Christians take Satan seriously. He is a person, just as much as you and I are a person. And I think about how that the, the verse right here is very clear. It says, be sober. That means to be sober. Be serious about this. Be vigilant. We need to take every precaution we can that the devil cannot attack us and have a victory in our life. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. You know in the jungle when the lion roars, you know what everybody does? They shake. Because the lion is the king of beasts in the jungle, and it's the same thing. Many people don't are not concerned about the roaring of Satan, and he's making a lot of noise nowadays. You look at our society, what used to be something that was hidden in a closet, and you say, Preacher, you talk about that all the time, because it's ever-present. It used to be in a closet, you'd never hear about it, you'd never see it, and all this wickedness and sin is now out before our faces. And listen, it parades down our streets in America. It's taking control of the lives of, of honest, God-fearing Americans. It's controlling our lives, all of this is, and it's nothing more than the roaring of the lion. Amen? He's behind it all. And it says that walketh about, and look at these last things, and you need to realize this, it's not the lost he's trying to devour. He's already got them. They're already his. But it says, seeking whom he may devour. That's talking about you and I. He cannot take our souls. He cannot send us to hell. But what he can do is he can devour us. He can oppress us to the place where we will not serve the Lord the way God wants us to. Amen. And we need to realize that. Now, I want you to think about I, in the title, I said, what is Satan's purpose? Let me give you the definition of purpose. Purpose, that which a person sets before himself and as an object to be reached or accomplished the end or an aim. Now, what is the aim or the purpose of Satan? His purpose is to destroy. He wants to destroy everybody in here, any individual, any family he can. And we're going to look at that tonight. But I want you to go back over there to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to start in verse number 1. And I want you to see several things here. I want you to see verses 1 through 3 of that chapter. It's a challenge to pastors. And I'll tell you what, a person that's a pastor, I pray for Brother Grandy very seriously every day. He's our pastor. And he has a great load on his shoulders, a great responsibility. And you know what the devil would love to do? He would love to see pastors tripped up. He'd like to see pastors back off from the goal that God has given them, that they would not be uh, the leader they should be. But look at the, the challenge here to pastors in verse 1 through 3. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now look at the next verse. It says, feed the flock of God which is among you. You will not go anywhere in America and get fed better the word of God than you get right here with Pastor Joe Grandy. And I mean that. What the devil would love for him to do is to water down the message, take away from the Bible, start giving his ideas instead of the Word of God, and the devil would have us by the short hair. Amen. 
But it goes on, it says, feed the flock of God. Uh, by the way, that word feed, it literally means to rule. And I don't think, and you'll see that in this verse, it's not to rule like a dictator, but you'll notice at the last of this verse what it's like. It says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for what? Filthy lucre. Hey, listen, if you get into ministry for money, you got in for the wrong reason. Amen? Uh, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage. There's nothing worse than having somebody that stands behind the pulpit and acts as a dictator, and if you don't do it their way, it's the highway. That's not what God intended, and I got real quiet there. But that's not God's intention. And then notice what it goes on. It says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being, what's that next word? Examples of the flock. Now, I drew a line from feed the flock down to example because that's what it is. It's ruling by example. Feeding the flock or ruling by example. Our pastor sets a great example, folks. If you were to come in here every day, he was in my, on Tuesday, he's in this office up here. You can come in. He doesn't know anybody's here. You know what he's doing? He's in there singing, singing and just praising the Lord. And then from Wednesday to Friday, he goes down the hall back into a remote room. There's no phone. There's nothing down there. And he gets alone with God, and that's where he studies. And what he's doing is he's studying, he's taking the Word of God in, and he's living it for us as an example to follow. Amen. But then look also in this same chapter, look at verses 5 through 7. This is an exhortation to obedience for everybody. Now there's a reason for these things. Notice in verse number 5, it says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, uh, yea all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. This is good advice for everybody, not just a few. Verse number 6, Humbling yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. How many times do we want to lift ourselves up and exalt ourselves? It never works. But you know what? When we're humble before God and God sees the humility, He sees our genuine heart and our service to Him, that's when He exalts us and puts us where He wants us to be. But then look at verse number 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Now, this verse is controversial to a lot of people. But, that word care right there, if you go to a nursing home, they have a what kind of giver? Caregiver. It's not cares giver. Okay, that word care right there means concern, energy for someone else. I'm convinced there's another verse where that word care is used in the same place, and it's referring to the same thing. Casting all our care upon him. Do you know what? He cares for us. Why not us care for him? Amen? And I think this is sound advice. This is for whether it be a pastor or the people that we will submit ourselves and we'll be humble before God and that we will take care of the things of God and care for Him because He cares so much for us. But then look if you're at the last one there, and this is, I think, again, sound advice for pastor and people both because we see, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom, what's the next two words? Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But here's the problem, and I think this is a serious problem. Not many today take Satan seriously. They really don't. He is a person. He has power, but he is not what? All-powerful. But he does have power. He has power to sway the minds of men and women. He has power to do things that we never imagined. He is not omnipotent, though. Amen. And I think also that he has a definite purpose, as the Scripture said, and that is to destroy you and I. Now, years ago, when I first started in evangelism in 1981, I went to Birmingham, Alabama. A Glen Iris Baptist Church was there. Jack Legrand was the pastor. And Pastor Legrand was so gracious to me. He, he gave me a set of cassette tapes. That was the day before CDs and everything. And these were testimonies. They had WGRB was a radio station in Birmingham. And they would have people come in and they would do live broadcast of the testimonies of these different Christians. 
Well, one of them was the name of Doreen Irvine. And she was a lady that was from England. She told her story. I still remember it. And you can go online and look up that story. I can't remember if it was Satan, Satanism to Sainthood is the title of it. But Doreen Irwin told about her life as a young girl. She was raised in London, and she was in a large family, and the family was very poor. She turned 14 years old, and her parents said, Doreen, you have to go. You can't stay at home anymore. We can't take care of you. And so here's a 14-year-old girl. She goes out. She begins to walk the streets of, of London and, you know, doesn't know what to do, doesn't know where to go. She needed money. She needed a place to stay. And she ended up seeing a opportunity to work in a nightclub. Now, of all places, why would anybody want to go to a nightclub? But that's what she did because she was desperate. Well, she went in there, and there were other girls that worked in this club, and they were very secretive. She was all by herself. She had nobody. She didn't belong to any group. And so when they'd have break time, all these girls would go and sit at a table where she'd go over to try to approach that table, and they'd get all up, and they'd walk away and leave. They didn't want her at the table. Well, anyway, finally, she went over to the table one day. She said, I know what you're all about. She said, I want to be a part of it. She had no idea what she was saying. And they said, if you mean that tonight after work, you get your best clothes and you come back here at such and such a time and we'll take you with us. She came back. They blindfolded her. They put her in a vehicle and they drove across London. She had no idea where they were going. And she drove across London in that car, blindfolded. They got out. They walked her into a building. And once they got in the building and they removed the blindfold, it was like a big auditorium. There were no seats. There were no chairs. There was a platform. And on the platform was a throne. And there was somebody sitting on the throne. It was a satanic church. I remember when I listened to that tape for the first time, my hair on the back of my head stood up. You say, well, I really don't believe that. Go ahead and believe that. And you'll be the victim that devil's looking for because he wants to find people that don't think it's serious. Well, anyway, she said, I got in there. What am I going to do? She said, I didn't belong to everything. And she said, I got involved. She started going through all the rituals that they did. And she ended up being a person that had satanic power that was unbelievable. And in fact, it came to the point that she was so looked upon as being filled with satanic power that she was chosen to be the queen of the black witches of England. I don't know about you, but that's not a good thing. And for some time, and I don't remember exactly, it's been a long time since I listened to the tape, but it was for quite some time that she was the queen, and she said, I had power that I could point at a bird in flight and knock it out of the air. She said, I don't believe that. Well, go ahead, don't believe it. She said, I could take my spirit through a wall and call my body through the wall. And all of that sounds so far-fetched. But remember, the devil has got power. He's not omnipotent like our God. And she said, then finally, the test to be the queen of the black witches was a test by fire. They said they built an arch out of wood, and it was set ablaze. And the object was to walk through that arch out the other side unharmed. She said, I started into that arch and I began to walk and somebody took me by the hand and led me through the rest of the way. I'll let you guess who that might have been. And she said that I ruled as the queen for a, very, uh, for a period of time. But then here's the indictment. She said, I'd walked the streets of London many times over the years. She said, I'd walked by a lot of churches. She said, but nothing ever fazed me as I walked by the churches. She said, but one night, she said, I walked by this church, and she said, something was compelling me to come into that church. She said, it was drawing me into that church. And she said, I began to turn to go in, and it was like Satan spoke to her verbally, you're mine, you cannot go in there. But she went in anyway, and guess what happened? She got saved. And today, at least if she's still alive, she had a ministry to drug addicts and alcoholics, and she had a Christian ministry. But you know what? A lot of people don't believe that. They say that's just fabrication. It's not real. But I'm sorry to say tonight that it is real. Satan is real. And Satan has a purpose. And I want to give you some things tonight of what he wants to do. Look over at Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 7. I think from time to time we all need to be uh, reminded of Satan's purpose. And he wants to destroy, he wants to destroy every one of us, and he doesn't care who it is. Anybody is his victim. 
But I want you to see to start with tonight, his purpose, number one, is destroy nations. And by the way, over the centuries, Satan has destroyed great nations, had destroyed them completely. And I sense since the beginning of time, he's used three different things. I think number one is one of the things he uses is pride. What happened to the Roman Empire? Wasn't Rome a very powerful uh, people? But what happened? Pride creeps in. Napoleon Bonaparte. Wasn't he a great leader and a great uh, statistician for military? What happened to him? Pride. All of that begins with pride, and it drags them down. I think another thing does it, and that's what's going on in America right now. Prosperity will be used by Satan to destroy a nation. We're the most prosperous nation on the face of the earth. But you know what today? Because of our prosperity, we don't need God anymore. We can do all this on our own. We make our own money. And the devil sits back, and what he does is he just claps his hands and says, Man, I've got them on the run. And I think another one is power. You know, the United States has been the number one power in the world for many, many years. But we've taken that for granted, and we think it's all in our own. It's got nothing to do with God. And I think also, what about the nation that God loves the most? What nation is that? Israel. And look what Israel has done. If you're looking from the Old Testament all the way through, Israel would be blessed by God. They'd have victory, and then they would do. They'd rest upon themselves. The devil would get a hold of their hearts, and the next thing you know, they went down. And again, God would have to bring them back up. The devil has a purpose, and it is to destroy nations. And he has been very successful at accomplishing that task. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to continue doing it until the end when he can't do it anymore. So don't think today, well, time is getting close. Jesus is going to return. He's going to back off. No, he is going to accelerate and do more to try to destroy it. Look at Revelation 20 and verse 7. It says, And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. A thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ, where's the devil going to be? He's going to be locked up. Amen? But here's what I'm getting at. He still wants to destroy the nations. Even after a thousand years like that, he's going to come out, and what is he going to attempt to do? Look what the next verse says. And shall go out to deceive the what? Nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And by the way, the reason he's going to do that is still to accomplish destruction upon the nations. And I think about why many, many nations are destroyed because they destroyed, they have the wrong priorities. Their priority at one time, I think about England. Boy, you read the old history, you got C.H. Spurgeon, you got all those great preachers over there. Uh, we've been reading in the devotional about D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody made many trips over to England, and there were thousands and thousands of people saved. And you talk about the Wesleys, just saw that one this morning. John Wesley, they would not let him preach in the sanctioned churches. And so what he did, he'd go into the countryside and he'd get a place and he'd get up and he began to preach. They said 10,000s of people would gather around just to hear him preach. Because God had a hold of that nation and people were serving God. You go to England right now. My son went over there. He sang twice in England, London. He went to Spurgeon's Church. Spurgeon's Church is probably not as big as this auditorium. And at one time, Spurgeon had over 5,000. The devil's still at it. He is not giving up. And I think about our country. What was our nation founded upon? It was founded upon the Word of God. It was founded by biblical principles. And I think of how our nation today, if you take your Bible, they won't you let you in. If you want to pray, they don't want to let you pray. Bibles are out of school. Prayer is out of school. And what do they have in place of that today? All this liberal philosophy and teaching that is uh, nothing other than of the devil. Psalm 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own uh, inheritance. Hey, listen, America needs to get back. And I know preachers been saying this, and I agree with him. I pray for it every day. We need to have a third awakening in America. And you say, well, it's impossible. Go back and read the history of the first two awakenings. They said it was impossible back then. But it isn't impossible if you and I, as God's people, will do our part. Today we're seeing an attempt by Satan to destroy America. And listen, what used to be wrong now is right and permissible. And also what was right now has become wrong. And that's, that's the devil's purpose. Look at Matthew 12 and verse 25. Here's a second purpose 
Uh, his purpose is to divide homes, and a home is the foundation of our society. If he can destroy our homes, listen, the devil's got a foothold. I think about in a lot of the major cities where there are many uh, unwed mothers, they have children or no fathers. You know the devil loves that. Uh, there's no security. I think about Agape, over at Agape. Brother Jackson's here, you guys that worked at Agape. The number one problem with most of those children was insecurity. They did not have security at home because mom and dad worked. The money was more important than the children. And as a result of that, they became insecure. Uh, you see divorce situation. Mom and dad are fighting and struggling. Listen, that's an insecure child. They don't want to hear that. And the devil knows that. And if he can break the foundation of society, which is the home, listen, he's got an inroad to the nation. Amen. Look at there at Matthew 12, 25. It says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against what? Itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not what? Stand. If you've got turmoil in the home and you have division in the home, sooner or later that home's going to fall apart, and the devil will sit back and laugh. If I was to go through here tonight... And, I, and I'm not putting a finger on anybody. There are many in here tonight. You came from broken homes. You remember when the split came about. You saw daddy go one way. You saw mama go the other way. And what did that leave in your heart, in your mind? It left brokenness. It left hurt. It left pain. And a lot of people that go through a situation like that, and the devil knows it, and that's why he does it. People that go through that, you know what it is? It's like a snowball effect. It continues, and it'll go from generation to generation to generation. I think about how he divides the home, husband against the wife. Boy, guys, we need to love our wives. We've been married 56 years. I love my wife more today than I ever have loved her. I wonder when the last time you looked at your wife and you said, Honey, I love you. And I don't mean love you. When we were in Tennessee, that was the phrase all those boys had used. They'd get off the phone with their wife and say, Love you. Love you. It was just kind of a catch word. I said, when's the last time you looked in her eyes and said, honey, I love you? Or wives looked at your husbands and said, man, you are my hero. You're my hunk. You're my man. You say, that's silly. Is that silly? Well, you know what the devil would rather have you do? Have you fight and argue and carry on. And it's unneeded. I mean, you say, well, I married a jerk. Hey, you're the one who picked him. <laughs> Man, you see that woman I married? Well, you see that? Well, you picked her. Amen. Amen. I had a little story I was going to tell somebody. It was a lady that was real upset with her husband to the point that she went to a lawyer, a Christian lawyer, to get a divorce. And the lawyer said, you sure you want this? She said, oh, I'm absolutely certain I want this. And he, she said, you get these papers moving. And so the lawyer said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and I want you to aggravate your husband as much as you possibly can. She said, how will I do that? She said, be nice to him. She said, make him every kind of food that he likes to eat. Tell him the kind words that he wants to hear. And he said, you come back in a couple weeks and you can sign the papers. She went home, took his advice, cooked the meals he liked, did everything that pleased him. And she went back to that. She got a call from the office. She forgot about it. She came back to the office. And she said, what, what do you need? She said, he said, it's time to sign your divorce papers. She said, divorce papers? Why would I want to sign those divorce papers? She said, I'm married to the best man that ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> So maybe that's the devil's way to destroy the home. But I think about children and parents. Hey, you know what? Today the, the devil is using that. Children and parents lack standards. You don't have any standards in the home. The kids run wild. That's not the way God wants it. God made mom and dad the leaders of the home to teach the children to do right. Amen. I think also about sibling with siblings. Uh, boy, uh, kids don't get along today. I mean, you see a lot of children today that they don't get along, they fight and they fuss and they carry on. And you know who's behind all that? It's nothing more than the devil behind the wife and husband problem, behind the, the parent-children problems, and behind the sibling-to-sibling -sibling problem. And we need to realize that. And don't play into his hand. 
We need to get into the Word of God, and you need to see what God says about the husband and wife relationship, about the children, and about siblings. Hey, listen, it's not a Cain and Abel situation, amen? Amen. It ought to be to get along and to to cohabitate without fistfights. But the devil knows that if he can get those things introduced into a home, that he'll destroy that home. And when he destroys the homes, he'll destroy the nation. But then look at Proverbs 22.6. Also, his purpose is to disrupt training of our children, whether it be public schools or Christian schools. I remember years ago when we were on the road, we were in Gray, Tennessee. And this church in Gray, Tennessee, Gray was a town of 500 people. And Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church, if you ever go to that area, Gray, Tennessee, it's a wonderful church. They were running nine, over 900 back in the 80s in a town of 500. And their preacher, Brother Gene Lastly, he was a man that stood by the stuff. He never, ever would uh, dip his colors. I mean, he stood for strong. We preached there for years and years back there. But I remember one time while I was there in a meeting, he said, you know, uh, this Christian school up the road, he said, uh, it would like you to come up and preach for their chapel. I said, that'd be fine. And he told me, he said, now, when you get up there, they call this a Christian school. But he said, it's not a Christian school. It is a name only. But here's the thing. When you have a a title and it says Christian school, do you know what ought to be in that school? Biblical godly principles. Not the same thing as the world has got to offer, but the things that God wants in it. And I think also in our public schools today, uh, I think there was a teacher that was talking to pastors sometime within the last six months that teaches in one of our schools. And they have this program going on around the country of the kids acting like an animal. Anybody ever heard about that? And they'll bring litter boxes in and they all this nonsense. And they said this is actually being done in one of the schools here in the area. You know, that is not of God. That's of the devil. Amen. And the devil wants to take our children. He does not want them to be educated in the things of God. He wants them to be educated in the things of this world and to be uh, gravitate to those things away from the things of God. What does that verse say? Proverbs 22, 6. Probably everybody in here could quote it. Train up a child, and when he is old, he what? Will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. I believe that to be 100% true. You got a child that's been saved, they live for God, but something happens, the world gets a hold of them and they kind of drift off. You mark it down, most of the time that young person will come to their senses. How many of you remember the prodigal son? In Luke chapter, what is it, 15? You remember how that prodigal got all fired up? He wanted to go into the world, the world was calling him and he took his inheritance, he went into the world. But when he got into the world and he realized everything that was going on in the world and he ended up where? In the hog pen, eating the slop with the pigs. He realized there was something a whole lot better at home, even if he was a servant and he went back. I believe that's the same thing that verse tells us. Children may go out and the devil may get their attention. They may go out and they may feast on the cesspool of the world. But sooner or later, they're going to realize that it's a whole lot better back where they left Christianity and the things of God. I think the training of a child is a primary responsibility of mom and dad. It's not the school. It's not the church, but it's the home. I think about how that how many moms and dads tonight in our in our Christian circles, how many have read the Bible to their children? How many of them pray with their children? How many teach them the principles of the word of God? But you know what they will give them? Is old, and when they get old enough, they'll give them that little toy computer. Or how many two-year-olds have you ever seen that can run a cell phone better than an adult sitting in here today? Man, who was it that had a child? They weren't over two years old. They had that cell phone. That's how they kept the kid quiet. And that kid would be there on a cell phone. Who's behind that? My son said this. My son said, if I ever had to do over again, my children would never have a cell phone until they were old enough to be out of the house and on their own. You take that for what it's worth. Amen. But at home is where the training ought to start. And you look at our public schools today. How many of you remember in the public schools they used to have dress standards? When we went to school... You couldn't wear blue jeans. You couldn't wear sneakers. You had to wear a sports shirt. You had to wear slacks. You had to wear some kind of shoes. The girls had to wear dresses. 
and they had a code for the dresses. I can still, who was the dean of girls at Zion? I can't remember, but if they came and that dress was too high, they would either send them home or they would staple paper to the bottom of their dress so it met the standard. What is it today? Man, it scares you to death when you go by the school and see how they dress. Uh, respect. What's a respect level today with most young people? Brother Charlie just gave me an instance today, taking the kids home in the bus. They were not listening to Charlie. They were running absolutely wild in that bus, chunking stuff out the window. Somebody stopped them in a car and said, you know, they're messing around and stuff coming out of your bus. You know what that is? That's a lack of respect for authority. And you shouldn't have to tell them more than once they should obey. Amen. Then I think about the violence. Man, our daughter, when she graduated from high school, they had a senior trip to New York City. And they took them to various places, and they took them to a public school in New York City. She said, Daddy, it was scary. There was policemen on every level of that building, armed policemen on every level. They had bars on the windows of this public school. And I said, well, why were the bars? They said that kept the kids from throwing each other out. The teachers in that school taught from behind a bulletproof glass enclosure. I don't know about you, but that's a problem. And that's exa exactly what the devil wants. He wants to see all of this. He wants to see things absolutely out of control. And here's what Brother Lastly told me when he said they wanted me to preach at that Christian school. He said, that is neither a Christian school nor is it a school. They are not getting an education. I wonder if, if how many people in America, if they know that the majority of people going to high school in the United States of America are literate. Illiteracy is, is unbelievable in the United States. And you say, what has that all got to do? It's got all to do with Satan's attack. That's his purpose, is to destroy the nations, to destroy families, and also to disrupt the training of our children. Uh, Satan disrupts by, even in the Christian schools, by, by doctrine. I mean by false doctrine, putting out stuff that's not in the Word of God. I think also by separation, strip away the separation. We ought to be different than the world. Amen. We ought to be different than the world, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we act, every one of those areas. And then I think also even in our Christian circles today that we even see uh, defiance to leadership, even in Christian young people. And it shouldn't be that. There's more concern today over the perversion that's going on in society about gender ID. I'm so sick of hearing about that stuff. Our military that was once the force that protected the United States of America is more concerned about legal lawsuits against the government and the people because they will not give them the surgery to change their gender. That's not of God. Amen. And this is all about the devil's purpose. Do we take it seriously? And what are we doing to counteract what he's doing? Look at 1 Peter 5, 8 again. Also, his purpose is to derail Christians as a whole. It says in the last part of that verse, Remember, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. If we're actively involved and we're enthusiastically serving the Lord, the devil will do his best to hinder, ultimately stop us from doing what we're doing. He doesn't want you to read your Bible. I know when I was in evangelism and I traveled, I would always have a quiz every night before we start the service of what had gone on the nights before that. And it was amazing to me of how many times you'd go to a church and you'd, you'd make a reference to a scripture verse and nobody had any idea of that verse. You read your Bible so you can learn and you can grow and you can be familiar with what God wants. I think about our prayer life. Do you know what? Everybody works now. Husband and wife both work. A lot of them have to do that because that's what it takes to make ends meet. And you don't have your time for your Bible reading your prayer. The devil knows that. Because prayer is our way of communicating with God. The, the prayer is our communicating with God and the Word of God is how He communicates with us. And anytime there's a battle, the first thing they try to do is destroy the lines of communication. And that's exactly what the devil does. I think also about witnessing. Tonight, Matthew brought forth a tremendous devotion about how that 
that we need to be careful about our be, being tithers. You say tithers of money, I tithe with money. Well, that's wonderful and that's right. But you know what else God has made us stewards over? Not just money, time. I told the guys in there after Matthew got done, we were in Benham's Baptist Church in Virginia, and the preacher said, I want you to meet one of my ladies. I said, oh, really? He said, she's an exceptional person. I said, oh, what's so exceptional? He said, she ties. I said, well, that's good. And then he said, whoa, whoa. He said, no, it's not just tither money. She has figured up how many hours they're in as a week, and she gives 10% of her time to the Lord's work, whether it's working around the church, whether it's knocking doors, whatever it might be. The devil doesn't want that. He doesn't want us to give our time to witness. Uh, also, he'll do anything he can to destroy our testimony. How long does it take to make up a testimony in a person's life? A lifetime. But how long does it take to destroy it? just takes a second. And the devil would love for all of our testimonies to be destroyed. I think also this, uh, put us in a, a non-active capacity. In other words, I'm saying he puts us in our comfort zone. Man, things are going great. Everything's fine. Uh, we're, we're experiencing prosperity. And we go back and we sit down in our comfort zone. And that's when the devil really attacks. Because, you know what happened with COVID? A lot of people got in their comfort zone with COVID. You know that? Uh, we couldn't go to church. And so they began to watch what? live stream on television and the next thing you know when COVID was all over there were no more restrictions where were a lot of people still they were in their comfort zone sitting back at home watching the services when they should have been in the house of God amen if we're doing nothing you mark this down he's not going to bother us because he's already defeated us but then look if you went over at the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 his purpose also is to destroy churches. He'd love to destroy Faith Baptist Church. He would love to destroy this church. He'd love to see it tore down brick by brick, and it no longer exists at all. And you say, well, how does that happen? Well, it can happen by poor attendance, by everybody having an excuse why they're not there. You know, I always think about excuses. When I pastored, people say, hey, we missed you the other night. Well, you know, Pastor, I had a headache, and I had a little bit of a sniffle. But if you would have called Monday morning, you wouldn't have got a hold of them. You know why? Because they went to work. Hey, listen, if we can go to work with a little bit of a headache and a sniffle, do you know what we could do? We could surely be in the house of God. Amen. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and look over there. I want you to look at uh, verse number 24 and verse number 25. Verse 24 is a very important verse in regards to this. In verse 24, it says, And let us consider what? one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Wow. You mean if I come to church and I'm faithful, I'm going to provoke somebody else to live for God and serve God? That's exactly it. I think about new converts. They come and they come on Sunday morning and boy, they get saved and they're all excited. Brother Grandy's told this story over and over again and they know they have church Sunday night. They come back Sunday night and there's only half the people. And then there, he's, well, man, there's Wednesday night service. Man, we're having church Wednesday night, and they get all excited, come back Wednesday night, and there's less people. What does that tell a young Christian? That says that the house of God is not important. Church attendance is not important, but it is. Look at verse number 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and I love this. Remember, Brother Granny preached this series so much the more as we see the day approaching. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, if there's anything we should be doing right now, we should not be backing off on church attendance. We should not be backing off on serving God. But we should be going forward because the days are getting short and Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. But then look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Here's another thing that causes churches to be destroyed. And that's by denying God-given authority. And I'm talking about the authority in the church. I'm talking about the pastor. Uh, be careful how you treat our pastor. Be careful how you speak to him. That is Pastor Grandy. That's Brother Grandy. Don't call him Joe. That's like going up to Brother Hiles and say, Hey, Jack. That's, that's disrespectful. You say you're, you're going overboard. No, I'm not going overboard. I'm trying to give you something because these are the things the devil will use. We start calling the pastor by a name similar to a buddy. 
His authority will have no impact in your life. Look at Hebrews 13, 17. Three times in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, it, re it refers to leadership. We'll look at just verse 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. I used to really, it pained me when somebody got a wedge and left the church or complained and griped. But you know, the Lord gave me peace about that. If somebody does not want to submit to the leadership and authority in the church, they need to go somewhere they can find somebody they can. And I'm not trying to be unkind, but all that does is causes a schism within the church, and the devil sits back, and he again, he claps, and he laughs. Boy, look at I've got a festering sore going here. It's going to explode. But look what it goes on to say. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. Do you know what, Brother Grandy? His eyes are on the congregation, and he's watching for our very souls. That's why he's so diligent in his study, because he wants to feed us that we can stay spiritually strong and spiritually healthy, that we can live for God. And then it goes on. It says, as they that must give account... Do you realize every one of us that have been in the ministry one day are going to give account for what we've done in the ministry? We're going to give account for what we have taught, what we have preached, what we have done. But then it goes on that they may do it with, what's that next word? With joy. It oughtn't be grievous. Pastor oughtn't come in here every morning and wring his hands and I wonder if everything's going to be okay, if the people are going to be kind. They're going to, uh, that shouldn't be the case. He ought to come in and say, wow, praise the Lord, I got a good church. And they're all full of joy and happiness. And they, they love the Lord. That's what he ought to do. You say, you lost it tonight. Oh, no, I haven't. I got it. Amen. <laughs> Notice it says that he must give account that he may do it with joy. And look at this. And not with grief. Who is this unprofitable for? You and me. Wow. Then look, all, there's another one that destroys a church, and that's by gossip. Woo-wee. Proverbs 26 and verse 20 and 22, it says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer, the strife ceaseth. Oh, Tim Lee was preaching in a church one time, and the pastor said they were having a lot of problem with, with gossip in the church, and it was really causing a serious problem. Brother Lee had no clue of what was going on. He's getting up there, and what does that say right there? It says, where there is no what? He said, the only problem you got in this church, you got to get rid of old lady Woods. She was sitting right in the second row. <laughs> uh, he said at lunch, the preacher was real quiet. He didn't say much. He said, uh, What's the problem, Pastor? He said, you've kind of lost your joy. He said, well, Brother Lee, he said, this morning you hit the nail on the head. The only problem was you called her by name. She was in the second row. <laughs> <clears throat> Verse 22 says, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. You know, sometimes gossip is irreparable. You can't fix the damage you've done. And then I think of James chapter 3 and verse 16, another reason that churches are destroyed because of strife within. James 3, 16, it says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. You know, one of, one of the things that causes strife is people that nitpick. Don't nitpick things apart. If you got something to say, go to whoever it is and say it, and say it face to face, and, and get it over with. Make it right. Make amends. But then the last thing I want you to see is this. His purpose, well, there's a couple more things. I'm hurrying, man. We started out early tonight, too. Look at Galatians chapter 1, of verse 6 through 9. Well, all you're going to do is eat ice cream. <laughs> also, another of Satan's purpose is to water down the gospel. Boy, if he can do that, oh, my goodness. Galatians chapter 1, of verse 6, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are angels from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have, we have preached unto you, let them be what? Accursed. And we, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have 
receive, let him be accursed. Boy, there's so many perverted Bibles out there today. I mean, they have gutted this book. They have taken words out. They've added words in. I like what Brother Gary Mann says. He said, they're not Bibles. They're just a book. Amen. Amen. I think it's also how they perverted doctrines. I mean, taking doctrines. Uh, Brother Sharp, and I appreciate Brother Sharp so much because he is a biblicist. He loves the Bible. He knows his Bible. And he says this Reformed theology, he said it's going on. They're trying, they've been doing it for years, but it's even being more aggressive today than ever before, trying to destroy the Word of God and the, the doctrines that are found in the Bible. And I think also there's false prophets out there. Man, you turn the TV on, you got all these people. Uh, we don't have TV, but we do get uh, YouTube sometime, and it'll have some blurbs on there about all these TV preachers. How many know who, what is it, uh, Jake's lives in a $53 million home? Amen. There's a lot of people out there that are preaching not for the gospel's sake, but they're preaching for the money. And I think about the compromises. The Bible doesn't mean what it once did, and we don't have to obey it like they did in years gone by. But then also, I want you to see this. Look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 and 29. His purpose is to doom sinners. What I preached about this morning, folks, is a very serious thing. And it's sad that, that people that are lost many times will not heed what the Word of God says. But it's going to be when the day comes and the buck stops, they're going to think back. Whenever they heard the services, wherever it was, they'll say, boy, I made a big mistake. And I think the reason is because they really don't take the devil serious. Uh, his purpose is to doom sinners too proud to come. I've said this in evangelism over the years, and you hear me harp on this altar. You say, well, this isn't anything sacred. But when you walk those aisles, you're doing two things. You're showing God, number one, that you're serious. And number two, you're showing the rest of the world you don't care what they think. And I think there's a lot of people that the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes on them. They know they need to do something, and they need to commit. This is a good place to commit, but instead they get up and they walk out those back doors because pride, they don't want anybody to think that there's something wrong in their life. In verse 28, it says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. I think also... The reason that many sinners are doomed, they're convinced that they are okay. I'm okay. I still have time. I think about that 20-year-old girl, that Pastor, that Benefield girl that he mentioned the other day, 20 years old, out of nowhere, what happened to her? She went into a coma, and they thought she was going to die. That could happen to anybody. And a lost person, that would be a scary thing, to think I'm on the verge of death and I've never been saved. Romans 3.10, that is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's nobody that's okay. Amen. But then 2 Corinthians 2, putting off getting saved, thinking there's still time, just like I mentioned. I've got time. I've got, I'm young. I've got my whole life to do it. No, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. And then also, they, he dooms the churches because, and sinners because they think they're getting saved by works. If works could save us, folks, Jesus would never have died on that cross. And I love how the scripture makes it so plain in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and what? And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Well, look what I did. You know what? I was good. And I, and I was good enough to make it into heaven. That's not what the Bible says. Satan has a plan, folks, and his purpose and he's zealously striving to complete his purpose on this earth. And I think it's sadly in many nations, in many homes, in many schools, many Christians' lives and churches and sinners, he has done just that. He has destroyed them. He has wiped them out. But you know what? We have a hero today. And you know who that hero is? The hero is the Holy Spirit of God that dwells inside of us. Because see what the Spirit will do. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. The Holy Spirit has given us an unction. And that unction is talking about the discernment that the Holy Spirit has given us within. 
We can know if we'll just walk with God and we'll ask the Spirit to show us. He will guide us and direct us so we can back away from all the attacks of Satan, whether it be as a nation, whether it be as a home, as whether it be as a, an individual, as a church. He will guide us and direct us to safety and keep us from falling to the pitfalls of Satan. He's real, folks. He's out there. And, uh, and he wants to destroy every man in here, every woman in here, every teenager, every child. He wants to destroy our church. He wants to destroy our nation. And by the way, the devil will never win. He's going to lose in the end. But we can be the victors ahead of time through the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Let me ask you tonight, is there one, just one tonight that would say, if I were to die, I'm not 100% sure I'll go to heaven. I know this, I don't want to go to hell. Would you just remember me tonight when you close in prayer? Anybody like that at all? I wonder how many Christians tonight would say, I know there's a devil, but I never realized what he's trying to do. I never realized the power that he has. But tonight, I want to be more aware of what's going on, and I want to, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, to be able to defend myself, my family, my church, my nation from the attacks of Satan. How many tonight that would be your prayer? Let me see your hand. Put it up high. I want to be one that will walk with God, and I will help defend my family, my nation, from the attacks of Satan because I'm going to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you tonight for our people. We have a great church, Lord, but all of us can kick it up a notch and we can draw closer to you and learn more about you and do more in our lives that is honor and glorifying to your name. Bless the invitation tonight, Father. Please, I pray, help us to be moved by the Spirit of God. And Father, we're going to give you the praise for what takes place, for we ask it in Jesus' name.